Hello again. Thank you for being here. Uh, this talk is not going to be very long. It's going to be about, I estimate, about 15 minutes. Uh, it will be a little bit self-referenced. I am going to be talking about things that I did, a couple of projects that I did. Um, with projects like that, unfortunately, what I, what I will tell you cannot be quantified, so I cannot tell you that my projects were 80% effective. It's just the general feeling that we got, the general feedback that we got, and overall the impression we got was that it was a very successful way to approach science and to attract people uh, to science. Uh, my involvement uh, with science communication started basically in 2007. Okay, um, yeah, sorry, a couple of details. I'm a co-worker of Manelo Sotiriu, so I'm working with uh, Science View. I'm also a researcher and uh, associate professor of uh, physical chemistry. This book, The Art of Science Communication, is uh, something I published with Menelaos, this one here. If anyone is interested in finding out about it, please come and see me later. And this is how my collaboration with Menelaos started. We met at a conference in France. So my involvement in what we call science communication started in 2007 when I participated in this competition called FameLab. Has anyone heard of this competition, FameLab? A couple of hands. Um, it was a competition uh, that was part of Cheltenham Science Festival in England. It was organized by Channel 4 and, of course, the uh, festival itself. And three years later, it started in 2005, three years later, they decided to spread it out, to take it to other countries. And Greece was one of the first countries to adopt it. It was organized by the British Council and the Ministry of Education. Um, so I participated in this competition because it looked interesting to me. Uh, I saw after my participation, by the way, I was the first Greek winner. I got the, <laughs> the committee and the audience award. That's why I started becoming very involved in science communication projects with the British Council afterwards. Um, my first impression about this competition was that it was none like any other I've seen before. I mean, you go to the United States and every school, every high school, every university has a science competition. But they're not popular. Not in the way FameLab became popular. Uh, if you're asking how popular FameLab became, I have to tell you that in Turkey it was televised and 25 million people watched the show on television. The winner in Croatia, he said to me, I couldn't walk on the streets without having people buying stuff for me. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same thing about me. <laughs> in Greece, things were a little bit more you know, low profile. But it became very popular. Why did it become popular? Because it adopted the format of popular shows. Probably you all know about Pop Idol, and America, you got talent, you know, all these singing, artistic shows where you have a judging committee, you have somebody performing for a few minutes and then he gets the feedback and then people vote. This, this is attractive for television. This is attractive for the audiences. This is what FameLab did. They adopted this format. And all of a sudden, FameLab became a very famous, successful science communication uh, competition. Right now, because it's been quite a few years since my participation, Right now, it's in 25 countries in five continents. It has gone truly glo global now. So that was my original um, participation. I was lucky because in Athens, all the finalists, me and the other nine guys that reached the final, we were all from the same city. You know, for example, in, uh, in England, they have different rounds and heats from different cities. So people are not from the same city, they're not neighbors. They only met for the competition, and then probably they never met again. But in Greece, we all came from Athens, at least during the first year. And that was good because we managed to keep in touch. And we thought, well, we all share the same passion for science communication. We all like to be on a stage talking about scientific topics to an audience. Let's do more things. Let's, let's take advantage of this momentum. Besides, we had the British Council supporting us by booking venues, printing uh, leaflets for us, communicating events. So we created a team, the FameLab team. Later it was renamed Psycho, but not in the crazy kind of Psycho, but science communication. And we set up the first, the first Greek science theater team. 
maybe, maybe we were the first in Europe, I'm not sure. I have good reasons to believe we were the first in Europe, but we were definitely the first in Greece. So the first project I want to talk about is that experience that I had through science theater. Um, it became evident to me after FameLab and during my science communication activities, what is the key to successful communication? And I gave, I gave a talk to Megaron, the Opera House, two years ago. I was invited by TEDx Academy. So my TED talk was why science is important in our lives. So I discussed five or six points. And then I discussed how to do science communication, how to take science to society. And my key message during that talk, and this is my key message also today, is that the mistake people make in education, teachers, science communicators, professors, journalists sometimes, the mistake that we make is that we make an assumption. We assume that just because something is interesting that people will want to hear about it. I mean, cancer research, right? It's very interesting. Cancer, you know, it's very, very interesting. But if you ask your relatives, how do they want to spend the Saturday evening, probably the answers you'll get is go to the cinema, go to the theater, go to a sports event, go to a concert, anything but a cancer-related talk. Now, science is interesting and let the good people of science take care of the problems, but I want to spend my time doing something fun. And the moment you realize that interesting does not mean fun, the moment you realize that interesting does not mean attractive to the general audience, that's the first crucial step. That's what I learned through my projects. I started learning, of course, my first hint was FameLab itself, why FameLab was successful and other competitions are not, because it was fun. So I started realizing with more and more projects that the key is to make it attractive, make the other person have fun, laugh, use comedy. And what's more successful than art? So I started realizing that art is a very powerful vehicle to use in order to convey any message. So our first project was Science, science Theater, the Fame Lab slash Psycho um, team. Uh, we wrote our own scripts. We collaborated with professional actors and professional directors to help us. But it doesn't mean that we became actors. You know, we're still scientists. But some help is also, also always useful. And um, on this slide, what I'm showing is, is ways other people have used uh, different tools to make their message attractive, not just interesting. For example, probably most Greek people know Apostolos Doxiadis, the writer. Why was he successful? He wrote novels about mathematics, but why their no his novels became bestsellers? Because he employed elements that make any novel attractive, mystery, drama, comedy, heroes, characters. It's not just about mathematics, it's not about the history of mathematics. He knew that if he makes it like a normal novel, it'll become attractive, and it became, and it became a bestseller. Um, Sophie's World, I'm sure everybody knows Sophie's World, was the first time philosophy became popular. I don't even know how many copies this book has, been, has sold, how many languages it has been translated, why? Why did people not read about philosophy before? And all of a sudden they, they did, because again, it, 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 it uh, employed elements of successful novels, drama, mystery, adventure. Uh, you have people in England playing the guitar and talking about string theory, doing stand-up comedy shows and talking about mathematics. They all got it. They got the secret. The secret is make it fun. Just being interesting is not enough. Make it fun. If you make it fun, people will come because they will enjoy their time at the same time while they're learning. So this is what we did with theater. We set up quite a few shows. Uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, we had here on the left, we had the science of love. So love is a general subject. And depending on who your audience is, you can, of course, adapt your script. You know, you can talk about love to adults. You can talk about love to kids, like primary school students. Um, in the middle, we had The Science of Christmas. That was our first show. It was based, based on a book an Englishman wrote. And on the right, we had The Science of Greek Mythology, and I am Zeus over there. I'm Zeus, and I'm talking about the science of lightning and thunder and ultraviolet radiation and lasers. But if you look at the clip on YouTube, people are laughing all the time. 
because the, the, the dialogues that we created were funny. So people came out of the theater and they thought, wow, we had a great time. He was so funny. Oh, yeah, and by the way, I didn't know that stuff. We learned stuff. See, if I told them, what are you doing Saturday night? You want to come to city? I'm going to talk about the science of uh, lightning. Nobody would come. Not even my mother would come. Nobody would come. But we made it in such a way that it was fun. It was, we used comedy. Comedy is the most serious way to transmit a message. So that's what we started learning through our experience. Um, let me go through very quick points in case some of you are interested in doing something like that at your school. Um, like I said, number one point, find a humorous approach. Everybody loves comedy. Everybody loves to, to have a good time while laughing. Keep the duration right. If you're talking about students, 60 minutes should be the absolute maximum. Don't go beyond that. Even less, maybe 45 minutes, especially if you have young kids. Um, a clever way is to combine the topic with the time of the year. So, for example, for the science of love that we did in various schools and the planetarium, the Vianidion, we did it on Valentine's Day because, you know, the synchronicity was right, the timing was right. Uh, science of Christmas, at Christmas, of course. Um, the best way is to personalize science terms. For example, when I gave my talk on FameLab, I talked about the effects of caffeine in our body. And I made sure every single chemical was like a person in a story. This is what people relate to, a story. So personalize things. Um, know your audience, because depending on your audience, you can find the most appropriate topic. So if you have students, high school students, sports is a good topic. But if you have an older audience, like senior people, then health issues or politics are more appropriate. You cannot talk about health issues to 12-year-olds. You know, they, they don't care about health issues at that age. So know your audience is a very also a very good point in order to adapt your script. The props that you have to use, of course, props are always welcomed. But as the professionals told us, when you use a prop, use it when you have to use it. Then get rid of it. Because if you don't get rid of it, it distracts the attention from the audience. It's, it's something that I never thought it would matter. You know, what does it matter if I have a couple of objects next to me? But it does matter, and that's what professionals told us. The absolute experts on communication are the actors themselves. So if you know actors, use them. Ask them questions. They are the best people to help you. Not just with setting up a theater project, but in, in, in giving a presentation in general. They know how to stand on a stage. That's their job. That is their job. So us talking to actors was very useful. And... Uh, yeah, of course, recording shows is useful because the science of Christmas was so successful, I still get people asking me, where can I get it? On video. And unfortunately, we don't have it on video because we never thought it would be so successful. We, they, they invited us to the National Research Foundation uh, in the city center on a Sunday morning, and they told us, you come for one show, there will be 100 kids. When we got there, it was 500 kids, and they asked us to do three shows. They said, oh, no, don't go, don't go. We still have buses coming. It was, it was phenomenal, the success. People loved it. The parents brought their kids every opportunity they got. And, of course, it goes without saying that at the end of the day, it's science you try to communicate. So never, never compromise the scientific accuracy for the sake of attractiveness. Make it attractive, make it fun, but always remember, you're a scientist trying to communicate some information. You're not an actor to sacrifice it. And having talked to you about... Spiros, we have about one more minute. I'm okay, sorry. okay. Um, very quickly, another project I did where I used art to communicate science and it turned out to be very successful was my collaboration with, an, with a photographer. She approached me, she said, I always wanted to do something scientific with photography. Do you have any ideas? And I said, well, if you go to events, like the event that NOC Lumphysicon did, you'll see many pictures of galaxies and bacteria and microscope images and telescope images. People have done that. So we decided to do something different. And we approached science through artistic portraits. So what we did is we took 30 subjects, 30 scientific topics, and we tried through those topics to imagine how would a portrait look like the portrait of a, of, a, of a scientist. Initially, we thought, should we dress you up as Newton or Einstein? But no, no, no. We wanted to be something more modern, something closer to the students' everyday life. So we created Click It On, Click for Ideas. 
And we had a very successful event in the city center. And we published also this book with all the portraits. Let me give you quickly some examples. So you probably can guess, you have diffraction, uh, Pavlov, Newton, cloning, pasteurization, DNA, Fibonacci. Every time a scientific topic was an inspiration to do something artistic. And we created a series of images. These are all the topics that we covered. So when the visitor comes to the exhibition, he looks at the picture, he says, well, that's just a picture of Spiros. I'm not sure if this is scientific. Then he goes to the text. He looks at the topic that inspired us. And after he reads the topic, the text of the topic, then he realizes, oh, okay, now I get it. Now I see why they took the picture that way. So this double take helps them to imprint on their mind the topic in a better and more effective way. And this is from the exhibition that we did. We did a five-day exhibition in the city center opposite the parliament. I never thought that many people would come for a scientific event. Nikos Dimu was the guy that wrote for me the introduction to my book. And he was shocked at the number of people that came. He never thought, he said to me, I'm 80 years old. I've, I've participated in so many things. I never thought a science event, science slash photography, would attract that many people. And you had uh, Vima, Kathy Merini, Mericia. You had lots of uh, newspapers writing articles about it. And this is the, so very quickly to sum it up and to close, uh, these are two projects that I did over the years. I combined photography with science and I combined theater with science. And I can tell you, nothing can be more successful in terms of attracting the attention and the, um, well, the presence of mass audiences than to make it for them fun. Science is interesting. All of us agree on that. Of course it's interesting. But it, you have to make it fun and attractive in order to take people's time. Okay? That's all. I'll be here for questions later because the time is pressing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.